speakers of this caliber. Uh, Stefan is actually one of the inventors of the transformer model that he described. So it's really exciting. And uh, I mean, have a seat. We're going to discuss basically AI in Africa today. So, uh, yeah, very comfy. Welcome to Tunisia. Yes. Uh, so I just want to clarify, I'm not one of the inventors of the transformer, I'm an inventor of the universal transformer, but I was involved in discussions of the transformer. I don't want them to get mad at me afterwards. <laughs> You're very modest. Okay, so the theme, I mean, uh, that we're interested in today is really AI in Africa. So how do we get the continent, how do we get countries like Tunisia, like South Africa, like Nigeria to take off? And I'm very keen to, to hear from you. So uh, maybe what we could do to start is uh, have each one of you uh, maybe introduce themselves in particular like where they're from, what the, the exposure has been with AI in Africa, in the case of Marek, well, he's an African company, so he would tell us also about that. But I'm very keen to hear your viewpoint and how collectively we can come, uh, we can find the solutions to overcome the difficulties uh, that are in front of us to make uh, Africa says, uh, you know, the opportunity offered by the fourth uh, industrial revolution. So we'll start uh, with you, Stefan, and go from there. Um, so this is when you sit right next to, to the speaker, then you need to speak back. I think, uh, so I, I'll categorize my, my response into two different issues I see uh, with why Africans are not actually um, active participators and, and shapers of, of AI. Um, the first one, I think, is related to us, how we see ourselves, and um, things like, you know, uh, people may not have, a lot of us may just not think, oh, well, you know, we may not have the confidence to try out certain things. Uh, we may not have, it's, it's not natural just to, to go through a university and have a deep learning uh, course in that university. Hopefully that will be changing soon. Hopefully we will have a cohort of students coming out who will have had access to quality deep learning training and machine learning and AI training um, at the university level in a general undergrad. But at this point, this is kind of still where we're at. We're at this point where people, we all need to realize that if you want to build something, all of the resources are out there. Like it's, really, it's really that simple. You go online, you watch a, a video, Download a book. A lot of these resources are free. Um, a lot of the books that we were talking about earlier are actually freely available. The frameworks are free to download. Which brings me to the second point, which is access to resources. Resources being uh, computational resources and also data sets. Um, I think on the computational side, we are getting to the point where that issue is addressed with cloud solutions that are available. The data set side is something we need to take ownership of. We need to create our own initiatives to collect and label data sets that are pertinent to issues in Africa that we are dealing with. That includes things like linguistic data sets, machine translation data sets, topic modeling and so forth, or image labeling data sets that are specific to, to, to uh, our set. Uh, that would be the magic. Can you tell us more about your background? How, you know, what, how did you, you know, get, became a chef of AI researcher? So, um, as I said, I'm from South Africa. Um, I, I started as, a, as an uh, electronic engineering undergraduate uh, with computer science. I realized I liked the computer science much more, so I started focusing more on the computer science. At the end of my, my undergrad, I realized, oh, this is really fun stuff. And to be honest, I didn't actually want to go work. So I had this opportunity to do a master's in computer science. And that's when I got exposed to, to um, you know, NLP, doc, uh, document uh, clustering and things like that. And then what happened was, as a result of my master's work, I got a publication at a, at a workshop at Koli in Beijing. And I was just like, very excited about this. So at this, at this conference, I made it my mission to meet every single person that I could and talk to them and tell them about my little model that, that I had, I'm going to be talking about on Saturday that clusters documents based on Wikipedia. And in the process, I met this professor called Professor Ed Hovey, who was from ISI. And he said, well, why don't you come and visit us in Los Angeles? And he didn't have funding at the time, but I hustled and I was able to raise some funds. I went there for a year and that really changed my, my view um, on machine learning research. 
after that, I was able to do another internship um, in Montreal uh, with, uh, with Joshua Bengio's group, um, and then a few other internships followed, um, and that you know, led me to, to work full time in the field. But I would say the, the, the biggest thing was once I realized that I wanted to work in the field, um, actively working on the networking, meeting people, and trying to build your own brand was, um, it, it, it is an uphill battle for us because you know, we don't necessarily, you don't just walk out of university um, knowing a lot of people who are actively working on the field. So we do need to put in the, the extra effort. Okay, um, I don't know if we just, I agree with everything that Jeff and says, and especially the cloud data, which I'll tell you a little bit, a few stories about myself. Um, um, 16 years ago, I wrote my first AI strategy for Africa on an April piece of paper before I ever, I've ever been to Europe. And that strategy is still something I believe in today. And it's about bringing the academic sector and the private sector closer together. If you look at, at, at ecosystems across the world where um, there's a lot of investment in AI, where top research is done, etc., those ecosystems are not safe. Stanford, for instance, the university benefits from an amazing policy, um, almost open access policy of transferring research into companies and professors wearing two hats, for instance. So, this, um, so it's almost as if um, uh, top research institutions and industry bleed into one and, and follow the same mission. And I think that's definitely one thing we need to get right in Africa as a strategy if we really want to grow AI. It's invest in research centers but not as research, in research centers per se, but research centers that are closely connected with industry and, and where there's a, a very active transfer um, where PhD students spend a lot of time in industry and vice versa and, and professors are allowed to not be measured on exactly how much they publish, but also their real, their real world contribution. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of growth, I'll tell you this story. Um, the first time I went to Europe, the, the big AI conference, I took in Cape Town and I spent uh, a two to three month salary just on buying the flight, the flight ticket to get to Vancouver. Um, when I got to Vancouver, I was cash trapped. I had like ten dollars, twenty dollars left per day. I lived in the cheapest possible youth hostel. Um, back then, the New York's workshops were held in very expensive ski resorts. I couldn't afford it, so I stayed in the forest in a, in a youth hostel that was an hour's walk away through um, through forest and the snow at night. Um, the first night I stayed there, the other, the, there's only one guy who was staying in the youth hostel with me um, to, to go to the nearest workshops. He was eaten alive by fleas. And uh, I thought, poor guy. Um, so he left after the first night. <laughs> I got in the house, I didn't have another guy who did it. So it was my turn the next night. I was covered in flea bites for the rest of the conference. Um, and so um, the deep learning and Darby initiative started for me because of I realized that so much of the action in artificial intelligence is abroad. It's in Western Europe, it's in America, and it's very expensive for Africans to be part of that dialogue. Um, and we now have almost a unique opportunity to really um, build the capacity and bring, bring all the actions to Africa. Um, let's give it a like. Thanks a lot for, for this uh, testimonial. Uh, very interesting to know where the double picture idea came from. You know. So uh, that, that's very cool. So, basically you know linking research and the private sector in sort of a dynamic Stanford style model. Uh, now for Alex uh, Tsado who is actually coming sit from Silicon Valley just be with us so you know round of applause for that. <laughs> you know Al Alex is from Nigeria so I'm actually very curious about his path and how he, he got today. He's one of the top uh, uh, cloud experts of uh, NVIDIA and also your thoughts Alex because as you know Stefan mentioned cloud is one of the ways we can overcome issues around hardware what are your thoughts about evolution of cloud and how it could benefit Africa as well thank you very much for that uh, Kareem uh, so as you mentioned I'll start with uh, you know my background how I got here speak a bit about cloud and even more importantly about you know the partnership between education and institutions This is working. 
So yes, I did uh, grow up in Nigeria, small city of Benin City. I see a few Nigerians in the crowd, so that, that's wonderful. And I've actually, I would say, grown up to be very Pan-African, you know, where I visited very many African countries, tried to do for the best across the North, East, West, South. So I really get a unique understanding of, you know, the continent and uh, just how different the different parts are, their challenges and all. But then at the same time, also see how we're also very similar and together how we can collaborate and work on important ventures like this one, which is, uh, you know, pushing artificial intelligence. In terms of how I got here, I actually started off like a, a, my, my, my colleague over there as an electrical engineer. I studied electrical engineering in New York, and, uh, but then I uh, got a lot of jobs doing building websites and then in Java, and then got more interested in computer science, so I thought that was more fun, and so I ended up working as a programmer. But after doing that up to a certain level, I started to see that, you know, um, in terms of uh, groups of, say, women or black people or Arabs, I would see that there are a lot of engineers and really, really smart mathematicians. But then what was missing was uh, an ability to tell the collective story or an ability to put together a great business strategy. And so that learning uh, drove me to apply to business school. So I ended up going to Kellogg for my MBA, right? And right after finishing from Kellogg, I started to learn about artificial intelligence and how that's really important and interesting to life. And it seemed like the perfect fit for me because I'm coming from electrical engineering and computer science and now I'm mixing business and storytelling together. Uh, I should go tell this story to these NVIDIA people. And they ate it up. So <laughs> that's how they employed me as a product manager there uh, in charge of cloud. And so the, really the vision and mission of that group is uh, through cloud, we want to make compute available for all the emerging Einsteins of the world everywhere they are in the world. So they can, if you're an emerging Einstein, you should get access to the cloud so that you can access compute, access storage, access all the infrastructure you need to, to develop. That was the dream, but one year into the job, I found out that that wasn't really everywhere in the world. Africa was missing from that cloud. And so I was like, you know, this, we have to solve this. Uh, you can access the cloud from here, but then it tends to be pretty expensive or pretty steep, pretty out of reach. Or even in some places, it's difficult to pay. Your credit cards or debit cards don't work, so you can't sign up. So it's really difficult. Some folks have been out. Some universities now provide you with free credits. I'm really happy that's happening, but that's increasing. So what would be your recommendation for the audience here? If they want to run machine learning at scale, yes. how could they get some cloud credits? Here and there. It's still difficult. We're still figuring that out. Uh, it's a big challenge. And uh, yeah, we're still working on that cloud piece. But then I would then say, I would then add that even more importantly, this, I agree with him when he mentioned that it is extremely important for the academic institutions to connect with the private. And when he speaks of private, he's talking about companies and corporations. That needs to happen. We've said that for over 10 years. It's really difficult, it's still slow progression. But before that gets there, I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to wait for decades for things to happen. And so I put together, I went and found other people who are similar, and we put together an organization called Alliance for AI, right? And so several times today, people here have mentioned, where do I go to learn? How do I connect with other AI practitioners? How do I find AI startups so I can join them? How do I find AI communities to join? Alliance for AI is the answer. You should pull up your phones and type in Alliance for the letter for AI.org. It's a non-profit organization that is bringing together all the, is trying to bring together all the practitioners of AI in Africa so that we can collaborate on that one body and share best practices so we can grow and learn together. Right? So you should really pull up your phone and join the community, join the newsletter. It's a newsletter, it's, it's, it's a group that is you know, being developed by its members. So when you see today, it's not its final product, but you should all together build it out. Put together learning resources on there so you can all see it. You can connect from Tunisia with your colleagues in Kenya and the rest of them. So like right there, we're creating our own small version of this academic plus. So pretty much what you have there is people who are learning and then you have startups. So the startups are defining what should be learned. And now you have this whole academic plus 
primary happening. So I'll pause for a second and later on we can talk about why it's important for Africa to really know about AI. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Alex. So, Ma Marek, actually, you know, I have a question for you which is about entrepreneurship. Uh, you were at DeepMind when DeepMind was a small company back then. Uh, now we work at InstaDeep. Uh, what drives you? What do you see as the entrepreneurial opportunities? And what, in your experience so far, is the opportunity for entrepreneurship in Africa and in Tunisia? Thanks, Karim. Um, so, to answer your question first, um, I think the... Um, I, How, uh, what drives me, I mean, what drives me for, for many, many years is to understand how the brain works. That's what drives me kind of in terms of curiosity. Uh, I think this is why I set up on a path that led me through a uh, study of medical physics of the brain and the study of neuroscience and uh, applying that very often to, to, to real problems that can be solved. Uh, so this is to apply problems like building products and, and so on. When it comes to your question about how, let's say, InstaDeep and DeepMind are maybe similar in, in a way, then, then obviously the, the answer is that uh, there's a, um, a large group of, kind of talented people and a, and a, and a focus on, on delivering a, a, a product and an applied solution. So we've definitely seen that at DeepMind uh, in the early days. That was clearly the, the breakthrough break, break research, uh, research, but also the, the, the product team was able to, um, to deliver some things that were the, the big players that this is a, a talented team that is worth investing in. Um, to answer your bigger question about entrepreneurship in Africa, I, I probably will go on a bit of a, a longer uh, story now. So I come from Poland. Uh, when I was growing up, Poland was a, a not a democratic country, not a country with free market. It was a country with uh, a huge amount of talented people whose kind of potential was waiting to be unleashed. And only after the barriers, the borders fell, the wall in, the, in Germany fell, it became possible for these people to kind of uh, explode with their talents and explode with the economic opportunities. Um, it was very important that uh, the, the country of Poland and all the countries in Eastern Eastern Europe had a roadmap to join the bigger Standards of the civilian economic community was what was setting a clear path about where the country needs to go in order to, to become part of this larger community, you know, the European Union, European Economic Area. Um, I think uh, that uh, when I am, have the privilege to talk to people from uh, Instadit Lagos, Instadit Nairobi, and Instadit Tunis, I see <coughs> a, a, a kind of also this kind of amazing entrepreneurial. hunger to uh, be able to solve problems at scale with, with enough resources, with enough networks, with enough, with enough kind of uh, uh, applications. And so um, I really sympathize with the, with the what, what was, uh, Ulrich was talking about, about how working on a budget is, is kind of a, 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 a difficult problem. Uh, and uh, I think uh, what I want to say is uh, that the, the, the best kind of way forward in order to, to build excellence is to, to build kind of uh, pockets of excellence where you can kind of, kind of hang out with the best, right? So uh, there's this theory in kind of, you know, global economics theory, how, how cities are where, where all the talent goes and you, and it's not just, the, it's the critical mass in the sense that you measure yourself against the best and you bootstrap yourself, you become better and better. And I think it's also something that is quite important in events like NABA that we come together as a, as a large group of people who get to know each other and can nurture themselves against each other in order to improve themselves and learn from each other. I also would like to point out that the barriers of communications are breaking down and there isn't really a reason why something like an Indaba X in a particular country couldn't be also mirrored by a video conferencing with events in other countries at the same time on the same weekend, right? Why not? I mean, people have viewing parties where they view 
TensorFlow Summit. Why not have a viewing party for Indaba? Talk about that. That's a great idea. Um, Definitely, next yeah. Indaba X, we're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then one final thing that I want to say, which is uh, there's a big hope in machine learning around uh, transfer learning. Um, we can kind of outsource, if we're on a budget, the, the training of the, of, the, of, the, of the complex models to, to, to people with, with, with the money, with the resources, and then adapt the, the released you know, inference networks to actually adapt it to our own problems. Uh, that, that allows, I guess, for circumventing this problem of, well, how do I get a billion images and, you know, and uh, 100 TPUs? If you just want to adapt the, the existing release network to your own domain, uh, obviously there is still a call out for research to make this you know, public play, but a lot of people are working on it from, from a neuroscience perspective because they want to understand how is it that humans can do it and networks can't. And uh, in a way, it will benefit the ability to, to kind of move quickly, even if it starts with, with just a really small. Um, well, thanks a lot. So uh, actually, so to summarize so far, in terms of like building up Africa as a superpower of AI, we're saying, you know, like a close collaboration between universities and, uh, you know, the private sector, the entrepreneurial hunger, uh, that's a good one. Uh, basically, cloud computing, opportunities to maybe find uh, compute in uh, within organizations, and use transfer learning. I would yeah, also like uh, what, what you just said about, uh, what you said about power partnership between, between companies and, and universities, and uh, there should also be kind of a, a partnership between companies and the young talent in a sense that, like, I would encourage everyone to spend their, you know, summer holidays if they're at university. Developing kind of your own set of skills and, and uh, understanding what it means to, to be in a business, uh, both as a researcher and as a, as a programmer, as a software developer. I think this is uh, really uh, one of the best le lessons to, to, to get to, the, to, the, to, to becoming a better person in, in that space early, rather than finishing your PhD at the age of you know, 27, having your first manager, so to 